Well, good morning, everyone. Um, we are welcoming you to our NWTC, Northeastern Wisconsin Technical College Innovation Series. This is the uh, fourth in our series um, of our innovation series where we are trying to bring new technologies that are emerging um, into the Northeast Wisconsin area and help folks learn more about them and how they might be applied um, for companies and for other, other folks here in our region. Um, we have a tremendous panel today. We are super excited about the resources that we've been able to bring together. Um, and so this, after, this morning, um, we're gonna just kind of get ready and start moving forward to talk about additive manufacturing. Um, and we've got some folks who are on the cutting edge and who are also out there using additive manufacturing on a regular basis to help deliver business results. Um, so I think this is gonna be a great opportunity for folks. Um, we are recording as well. There is no chat function, um, so kind of doing that clean, doing the, the bits and pieces here. There is no chat function, but if you have a question, please, please put that in the Q&A. Um, the four speakers that we have lined up today are very excited to take your questions um, and interact with you and share their industry knowledge. So please, if you have any questions, put them in the Q&A. Um, and when we're done with the four presentations, um, we will come back to those and hopefully get some great questions and get some you know even better answers fantastic all right so i am going to stop sharing our title screen um and i am going to introduce our first speaker um we are very excited to have david ramirez um, he is a marketing manager from re3d tech um, and he's here to share his thoughts um, on additive manufacturing with us good morning david Good morning, Jill. Thank you for that introduction. Um, I'm here on behalf of Re3D Tech. Uh, I can start sharing my screen here with you guys. <clears throat> can you see what's, can you see my screen? That looks perfect, David. Go ahead. Perfect. Thanks. So um, some of the things I'd like to share is, is more of a general overview on some of the innovations that we've seen in the 3D printing industry, um, some of the opportunities that are out there in terms of applications and use for 3D printing. I have some cool videos to show you guys. Um, just a little background on Re3D Tech. Re3D Tech is a additive uh, manufacturing startup um, founded roughly six years ago by uh, James Toiber. He started with one desktop 3D printer on his desk and he tells this this really funny story that he brought his wife and four kids into to the office when he'd opened up and he showed them what what he was working on the last year and his wife goes, that's it? Like, how are we gonna pay our bills with this this little printer that's sitting on your desk? But fast forward to six years, um, we have dozens of printers, printers you can't even wrap your arms around, uh, how big they are. Uh, we were recently acquired by a private equity company as well. Um, they're called Core Industrial Partners, and they've created this platform with us as the first acquisition in a $700 million fund and they are planning to just roll companies into this platform to create this big digital manufacturing company. And we're rebranding, um, hopefully by the end of May, we're going to be called Uptive. Uh, dis that's a play on disruptive manufacturing. So anywho, let's get started on talking about 3D printing. And I'm not sure how well-versed uh, some of the attendees are, so I thought I'd give a general overview on what additive manufacturing is. Additive manufacturing is essentially a manufacturing process that creates objects by adding successive layers of material. You're basically stacking pancakes on top of each other till you get a 3D object. Now, re, or, uh, 3D printing has been around since 50, 60 years. Um, and it all stems, all the parts that are made uh, 
by a 3D printer stem from a computer-aided design. So a 3D model is required in order to create objects. Now, we've had customers, potential customers, send us pictures of a drawing they put on, a, they made on a napkin like the night before, and they, they submit this file with a request for a quote saying, hey, can you print this for me? And my, my feedback is always, yes, in theory, we could print that for you, but someone has to do the 3D modeling to take your napkin idea and bring it into the digital world. So a digital model is required to do 3D printing. Um, one of the things that happens in the 3D printing process is we take that digital model and we actually slice it. We slice it into all the layers that are going to be stacked on top of each other. And that creates something called G-code, which, which are the instructions for the 3D printer to lay down every layer. So not only do you need the 3D model to start with, but you also need what is called a slicer, uh, some sort of software to slice that 3D model and create the instructions for the printer. And that's, that's what you send to the printer to create the object. So quick overview, there's more processes than I can speak to in 30 minutes. Um, but just a quick overview on some of the 3D printing processes that are out there. We have photopolymerization. This is more of a resin-based process. You basically have a pool of this resin that is being cured layer by layer. And so once a layer is cured, it moves out of the way. Then you have a wet layer that gets cured again and it's creating every successive layer that way. Uh, material extrusion, uh, better known as FDM, is probably the most popular version of 3D printing. That's what you'll see in most consumer 3D printers that just sit on your desktop. It's sort of like the hot glue style of 3D printing. You're extruding material through a hot tip and laying each layer on, stacking each layer on that way. Material jetting is similar to um the ink printers that we see that all of us are familiar with that go back and forth and leave the paper soaking wet because they dropped a lot of uh ink droplets on the on the piece of paper it basically works exactly the same way it's it's dropping powdered material as opposed to a resin or uh, a filament of material it's laying powdered material and you're curing it with agents or you're curing it with, with heat uh, to form each, each layer. Uh, powder bed fusion works in a very similar way. Uh, a lot of times you'll see lasers in powder bed fusion and that is how each layer is cured or formed. Um, Multi-jet fusion is a process where agents sort of like adhesives for lack of better words are what are curing the layers and and fusing them energy uh, direct energy deposition uh, resembles more welding where you have material and energy being deposited um, to form each layer sheet lamination i'm not very familiar with i'm sure maybe one of the the experts uh, that we have on our panel can speak to that. Um, probably a less less popular method of 3D printing. So there's there's a little more to 3D printing than um, your average person would know. We've we've been in 3D printing, like I said, for six years now, and this business has grown uh, substantially. We're now in this portfolio, we have over 140 employees. And when I joined the team, we only had 10. Um, so needless to say, the business has grown significantly, but there's more to 3D printing than just creating the part. As you can see here uh, on the left side with the, with the powder bed systems, 
once the parts are made, you have to basically go and dig up the parts through all the unused powder. And then you have to clear the powder off the part, get the powder out of any pockets that the, the part might have, clear holes and passages. And sometimes the customer requires the part to be a certain color, certain surface finish. So then there's additional processes that happen uh, after the part is printed. You can see all the equipment down here, the HP equipment. Um, here you have the printer, you have the build cart, you have the cooling unit, you have the processing station to clear up all the powder. So there's a lot more to this than just uploading a part and hitting print. And likewise, likewise for um, the FDM or DMLS processes, um, there's material or support material that needs to be removed. You can see this part, this metal part here has a lot of support material underneath it because it has sort of an overhang. So for processes like this, material needs to be laid out ahead of time if you're going to start a geometry three inches above the build plate. So there's a lot of work that goes into removing support material as well. And here off to the left, we have uh, parts going into a center oven. So depending on the style of process that you're using to put these metal parts together, a lot of the times they won't be finished. They won't have the exact material properties that you're looking for. So you have to put them through some sort of heat cycle to, to get the layers to fuse, to get the material to adhere to each other and get the material properties that you're looking for. So it's a lot more than just printing. So take that into consideration uh, when you get a quote back from us. <laughs> There's more that we're accounting for than just making the part for you. So just a quick overview on some of the materials. I mean, at this point, it seems like there's virtually no limit to what you can print with. I've seen, I've seen wood as uh, I've seen 3D printers that can print in with wood now. I've seen 3D printers that can print um, food, that can print, you know, human body parts. Um, but we stick to just mechanical components here. Um, for the most part, we focus on polymers and metals. Polymers, at this point, probably the easiest thing to 3D print with, simply because you, you can melt, fuse um, that material pretty much any way you'd like. Metals is, is where the, the industry still has some work to do. Uh, in terms of uh, the speed, the capacity for metal printing. We can print right now, but it's very slow. Um, the, um, the quantity of parts that you can get out of one build is very limited still. That has to do with um, the technology of the equipment, the technology of the material. Ceramics is another one that's gaining popularity. You see that a lot in jewelry, research and development, uh, sculptures. Composites is one that I'm very excited about because that's sort of like polymers and other filament uh, based material. I'm very excited about that. Um, you see, uh, you see composites becoming more and more popular because they give you very high strength for a very lightweight part. And the 3D printing lends itself to creating very lightweight parts. But to be able to go and supplement that, that part with, um, with filament of carbon fiber or filament of Kevlar, like you see in this this part right here with the yellow filament, that's Kevlar that's being used to reinforce um, this this component. So you're gaining a lot of a lot of strength and you're maintaining 
uh, the lightweight design that you're able to achieve by 3D printing. So what are some of the advantages here in using 3D printing? For one, speed. Um, if, if you had an idea, let's say 20, 30 years ago, and you wanted to see this, this component, wanted to see this component come to life, how would you even go about that? Who would you call, who would you contact in order to, to create just an idea that you had? Um, it'd be very difficult. You would have to contact several people and then good luck trying to get them to take, take on your business of, of just creating one component. So that 3D printing offers a very low barrier to entry. All it requires is a 3D model, really. So you have the 3D model, you can send it to a service bureau like us, or if you have your own desktop printer, you're really just sending the, the part to the printer and hitting print. So parts can be made in hours, if not days, as opposed to maybe a couple weeks with more traditional methods. Um, not that those methods are necessarily slow, but they require, um, They'll either require, you know, maybe if you go to a CNC machine shop, you might have to wait in line because those things are only putting out, you know, one part at a time where oftentimes with the systems that we have, if there's extra space in the cube, we could throw your part in there with other orders that we're working on and you can have your part overnight. Design freedom, 3D printing basically virtually has no, no constraints on your designs. And you know, take that with a with a, a grain of salt because there are designs that won't necessarily create the final result you were looking for, but the three D printer will put they'll it'll stack all those layers on top of each other, but you might not get the results that you were looking for. But you virtually have unlimited design freedom with three D printing. Just look at this metal part that I have here the the inside of it has a lattice structure you pretty much can't achieve with any other manufacturing process the materials are we're, they're constantly adding to the types of materials that are available for 3d printing i know the resins have virtually unlimited um what would you call it um like the the chemical makeup of these resins is virtually unlimited. Uh, we were working with um, Loctite uh, sometime last year, and they basically said you can come that you could come to them with specific material properties that you're looking for, and they'll custom make a resin that will print and and achieve those exact material properties that you were looking for so highly highly customizable in terms of material and in terms of your design as well one of the beautiful beautiful things about 3d printing is if you created a design let's say an injection molding and you you created the tool to make the part and then you found out that there was a flaw in your design for you to go back and create those changes in the tooling is not always so easy, especially because you're removing material. It's much harder to add material to a, a piece of tooling if that's the sort of change that you need to make. With 3D printing, you'll just go change the digital model and send it to the printer to make the new version of the part that you, that, that you want. So that reduces a little bit of risk when it comes to prototyping. You're not having to commit to uh, tooling uh, and you know, not to knock on injection molding. We now offer injection molding as well in our portfolio, but uh, this is about the advantages of 3D printing, right? So when it comes to prototyping, a lot of people tend to lean towards 3D printing now because of that reduced risk. If, if the part doesn't work out the way it was supposed to, 
you haven't committed to buying a big piece of tooling and the time that that takes. So you can make iterations very quickly. And of course that comes with uh, cost savings as well. So how does, how does 3D printing play a role in manufacturing, in businesses? Uh, for one, you streamline your, uh, your recruitment network. This, this example down here is a very good example of a component that required eight pieces to assemble. So you have to go purchase components from possibly eight different vendors. Then you had to bring them all in and you had to put them in an assembly line to assemble each component for this bracket. We, that This all could have been achieved in a single piece um, when, when using 3D printing, it created a part that is 40% lighter, 20% stronger. It's not always the best option. Obviously, if you're going to do mass production or super high volumes, but you can, you can think about possibly the research and development stage, the testing stage, small production runs you see that a lot with these uh electric vehicle launches they're not they're not making a hundred thousand of of these vehicles they're maybe making a hundred three hundred five hundred a thousand so it doesn't require traditional uh methods of recruitment or manufacturing because you're not doing a hundred thousand you're not doing five hundred thousand or a million so that allows companies to get to market faster and I would I would rephrase that and I would say get to solution get to the solution faster it's not always it's not always that you're trying to create an end use part sometimes you just need something down and dirty in your assembly line you need to create a component that's going to help your assembly line move faster so it's not always about the end use part but getting to a solution faster whether you have a 3D printer at your facility or you have someone like us nearby, you come up with an idea that's going to help your assembly line, that's going to help your workers, you can have that idea created in a matter of days. And one of the other advantages for the supply chain is reduction in inventory. So we see this with, with parts that have been out for a decade, parts that are towards the end of their life cycle, and the, the new version of this product is coming out, but the company still has millions of these legacy products out there, and they have to produce replacement components. And they're not making one at a time. They have to make 10,000, 50,000, and then put them in a storage unit or a warehouse until they're needed. Well, with 3D printing, if you had designed for, for these, if you had taken that into consideration in the start of the development process, you could store your inventory digitally and print parts on demand for replacement and legacy components. So we see that a lot in vintage automobiles, vintage boats, or just consumer products that are no longer in production um, some people have made entire businesses on replacement components for consumer electronics that the OEMs are no longer making replacement parts for. So I think the next slide is a video. Let me see. Yes. So I'm going to play this video. This is a really cool case. When we first got the Mark Forge printer, I honestly didn't think it would be as good as it is it really surpassed my expectations. We were trying to get a full robot set up in our molding press, which takes thousands and thousands of parts per month. Typically, we load each one of the parts in the tool manually 
we're running it in a mold that has a running temperature of 275 degrees. So you're literally putting your hand right on a burner, basically. And I've gotten burned. I've had my son try it. He's got burned. I started off thinking, how do I make this not a robot? I figured, well, heck, I want to try an industrial machine, and we ended up getting an X7. I designed a fixture. I need to use a trigger mechanism like a garden hose where you pull the trigger and it can release all eight pieces into the mold. I thought, man, that's going to fail. It's going to get halfway through, power's going to go out, the machine's going to have a failure. I just thought, nah, it's never going to work. And I printed it all. It took 27 and a half hours and I was blown away. It worked. And this is literally the first, my first iteration that I made. And we ended up running it like two days later in production out on the floor. Manually loading them versus putting them in with the claw, there's a good 15 second difference. When we first started, we were doing 6,000 manually. And then after the claw was made, we're up to 10,000 parts today. We literally did 50% more output in one day. That's unbelievable. You know, it's something that would have taken us two, three weeks to machine. I did it in two days. Faster cycle time, safer, more consistent part quality. Putting continuous fiber inside the parts is incredible. And there's just more and more applications that we find for it daily. And that's a good question to ask ourselves is what, what else can we do with it? The supply chain has become an issue, but Mark Forge has helped us get through the issues we have had. You have control of when you can get something, how it can be made. We can make very useful, productive, and helpful tools for not just us, but our customers. It's very powerful. It's something that I'm constantly trying to find the little thing to solve that will add up to be a large benefit in the end. There's so many things that you can improve in a shop. You don't have a limit to what you can make. It's not gonna be very costly and it won't take a lot of your time. You don't have to start with a square block anymore. You can start from the ground up. When we... So yeah, I mean, really, really cool case study. Um, like I was saying, it's not always about the end use parts. It's not about trying to compete with traditional manufacturing methods because we oftentimes tell our customers that, hey, this 3D printing is not the right process for this kind of volume that, that you're planning on doing. Why don't we explore maybe some soft tooling or do you know something else? But to be able to do what, what these guys did at zero tolerance and just come up with an idea that's going to help your company put, you know, increase output by 50%. And because of that low barrier to entry, all you need is a 3D model. You send this over to someone who can 3D print it for you and you, you prove your concept right away, you know, in a matter of days. And in a matter of days, they, they, came up with a solution that reduced uh, reduced this this one step in their process from 15 seconds to three. So really cool stuff that that you can do with 3D printing. Some of some of the markets that we serve, uh, I I listed on here. Consumer goods, man, you'd be surprised at the stuff that we see. We see uh, replacement components for electronics, for headphones. Uh, we see a lot of panels like this. We see panels and and housings for products that are that they're doing super low volumes for or custom. There's a lot of uh, custom consumer products or electronics for videography, for you name it. But they're, you know, they're a very niche market and they only need to make a hundred or they're a startup as well. And they're, they're working their way where they're working the kinks out of their, their product and additive manufacturing is perfect for them because they don't have to tool up. They don't have to deal with the stress of trying to think so many, so far ahead in advance for 
what are the possible changes that are going to come up later they just they can take the changes as as they go automotive as i mentioned before especially with all the electrification that's going on right now um, hardly any of the oems are producing super super high volume right now in terms of their electric their electric vehicles so right now 3d printing is is a very very much a viable solution for these low production uh, quantities in the automotive market healthcare is something i'm very excited about because one of one of the advantages that i mentioned before about 3d printing is it's highly customizable and very much like our finger, fingerprints and no human no no body is is exactly the same so when it comes to prosthetics when it comes to casts you can make casts uh with 3d printing that are that fit like a glove for for the individuals i don't know if if many of you have heard of smile direct club or um what's the other one i forget the other one's name but the invisalign invisalign is the other one they create these uh transparent braces basically that you put over your teeth but the way they create those molds is by scanning the the person's mouth creating 3d models and then they print each iteration they 3d print each iteration that this person's going to go through in the the moving moving of their teeth and they create the braces the you know the transparent braces from each one of those molds so without that without 3d printing you don't have invisalign at least not to to the volume and to the amount of people that that it's helping so that's i think a big big industry for 3d printing is going to be healthcare aerospace you're always fighting to make something as strong and as lightweight as possible and with the advantages that 3d printing offers i can you know sky's the limit pun intended for for aerospace because you you can always make parts stronger and you can always find a way to remove material i think i have one more video after this to kind of show um where 3d printing is headed the video that i that i have is um hp's metal 3d printing that they have uh that just came to market and one of the one of the things that really um propelled the 3d printing industry was hp's approach to plastic and how you can have this cube this print envelope and however many parts you can fit into this cube that printer will print in a matter of 15 16 hours so that has lent itself uh to 3d printing competing in some of this mass production or low volume uh production for end use parts and of course adding adding speed to prototyping as well so now i'm excited that this is going to be introduced into the metal market which is where i think this really takes off if we can produce metal components with complex geometries at a at a quick pace with a competitive price then i think 3d printing is really going to cement itself as a a manufacturing process that's here for a very long time so let's jump into that video by leveraging and extending hp multi-jet fusion technology for printing 3d plastics hp metal jet can propel your business forward with the most advanced metals 3d printing technology for mass production get ready to take on new jobs and unlock new revenue streams inside the printer the carriage features six print heads arranged across two print bars up to four different nozzles can print HP binding agent in the same 21 micron grid on the powder bed providing four times nozzle redundancy 
The printing process starts by spreading a layer of metal powder. Then, HP MetalJet binding agent is jetted at precise locations onto the powder bed to define the geometry of single or multiple parts. The energy source helps evaporate liquid components and cure the material. Once printing and depowdering processes are complete, a high-strength green part is removed from the build unit and sintered using an industry-standard sintering solution. The loose powder is recovered from the HP MetalJet Powder Removal Station and transferred to the HP MetalJet Powder Management Station, where it is automatically mixed, sieved, and loaded into another build unit for the next job. HP MetalJet breaks through the productivity, quality, and cost constraints of existing 3D printing technologies for metals. Compared to powder bed fusion, HP MetalJet produces more isotropic grain structure in the sintered part, resulting in more uniform material properties. Compared to metal injection molding, HP MetalJet technology eliminates the time-consuming debinding process, freeing up to 20 hours from your workflow. Now you can accelerate innovative designs and products and efficiently produce high-quality 3D metal parts at scale. Get ready to experience unlimited capabilities. HP MetalJet. Reinvent opportunities. So that's, that's basically it. Feel free to take a picture of this if, if you want to reach out to us. Um, doesn't hurt to just have a conversation on the phone either. We can help you just brainstorm some, some, some of your workflows or, or thoughts. Awesome. Thank you so much, uh, David. That was a fantastic overview. We really appreciate that. Um, one of our, our final speakers is actually going to be from HP, so I think she appreciated uh, some of the, the technology you were sharing there. That was exciting to see. Um, and I love the video um, of the company in Michigan. You know, that feels real close to home here up in Wisconsin um, in terms of, you know, folks using these solutions, um, using 3D printing to find solutions that can, you know, almost double the productivity of that work center. Um, that's exciting. So um, fantastic. Appreciate that. Um, next, we have from the Milwaukee School of Engineering right here in Wisconsin. Um, we have one of their professors in engineering, Vince Antewinter, um, who's going to be sharing more with kind of what's on the cutting edge um, with prototyping and design. So Vince, thank you so much. Um, feel free to introduce yourself a little more, but we, we look forward to you sharing more information. Thanks. Thanks, Jill. Appreciate the opportunity. Just gonna share my screen real quick here. Give me a quick sec. Here we go. Can you see my screen okay, Jill? I'm assuming you said it was great. <laughs> yep, perfect. <laughs> okay, great. Well, as Jill said, uh, I'm Vince Anwinter, Director of Milwaukee School of Engineering's Rapid Prototyping Consortium. Uh, I'll start off with a little bit about me so you understand my background. Uh, I've been here at MSOE for 19 years. Uh, I did start off my uh, career in traditional manufacturing. My background uh, actually started off uh, in a two-year school, uh, Marine Park uh, Technical College, part of the uh, Wisconsin Technical College uh, system. Uh, where I obtained a tool and die degree. I went on to uh, complete my apprenticeship in tool and die, focusing on injection molding, casting, stampings, et cetera. Uh, then I uh, came to MSOE, uh, finished my bachelor's degree in finance while I was here, uh, and just fell in love really with the additive manufacturing industry. It's a, it's a fantastic industry, lots of opportunity for creativity, lots of opportunity to, to really make a difference in the world. Um, heavily involved in the industry. Um, I've served on the board of the Additive Manufacturing Users Group since 2012. That's the largest users conference for the additive manufacturing industry. For any of you users out there, I, I uh, highly recommend you check this group out. Uh, it's pretty phenomenal as far as opportunities to share thoughts, ideas, best practices, etc. cetera. Uh, I also serve on the advisory board for St. Louis University Center for Additive Manufacturing 
and uh, on the board for the Photopolymer Additive Manufacturing Alliance. So quite a bit of industry involvement. Um, <clears throat> that's one of the things I really enjoy about my position here at MSOE is, is we're really, that's, that's part of the role is to be involved in the industry and kind of bring that back to our members. So a little bit about MSOE, got to do a little pitch, right? Um, MSOE, private university founded in 1903, downtown here in beautiful Milwaukee, Wisconsin, approximately 2,800 students, 16 bachelor's degrees, 11 master's degrees. Uh, we're best known for our engineering degrees, but we have a phenomenal nursing program and uh, in a spectacular business school as well, ranked among the best in the Midwest from the Princeton Review. So for any of you folks out there that have kids going to college, I highly recommend you check it out. I, I went to MSOE actually, I, I recommend it as well. Ah, and we've got a couple of alum, our, our, one of our next speakers, Steve is also a net proud MSOE alum. Uh, so we've been very involved in the additive manufacturing industry and, and that's kind of a, uh, an element of pride really that I think MSOE's made a huge impact on the industry for being kind of a small private engineering university in the upper Midwest here. Uh, I think we've we've had a, an outsized impact on the industry, which is exciting and, and kind of a source of pride for us. So a little bit about the Rapid Prototyping Center. Um, we're a little over 30 years old now. We started in 1990, 1991 uh, with a 50% matching grant from the NSF. And being a small privately held university, um, the uh, president at that time uh, told our, our uh, Dean of Applied Research, hey, that's great, you got half the money. Now go find the other half. Um, so uh, I always like to joke about that. Uh, you know, there's a saying that uh, necessity is the mother of invention, and I believe it certainly was in this case as well. Um, we've always had a lot of close ties with, with local industry, and so our dean at the time reached out to a couple of, of uh, corporate partners and said, hey guys, there's this new technology coming out called stereolithography. We think it's gonna be important. We think it's gonna be a game changer in the world. We'd like to get involved. We'd like you guys to get involved. So uh, we'd like you to chip in, we need your help. So each of the four initial founding companies each chipped in a, a certain percentage uh, and that allowed us to acquire our first SLA 250 back in 1991. Um, which really gave birth to the concept of the consortium. Uh, since then, it's it's expanded to over 40 companies, uh, but really our mission has kind of stayed the same. And that, that mission is to help our members develop and integrate custom additive, additive, additive manufacturing solutions into their operations. So really our goal is to help our consortium members um, Firstly, stay aware of new developments in the, in the industry, then disseminate these new developments, and finally integrate them into their operations in ways that add value. Uh, we're staffed by four professional staff members, full-time staff members, and about 15 to 20 MSOE student interns, mixtures of grad students, undergrad students. Uh, we hire from any discipline. We feel that additive manufacturing has the opportunity to really touch all aspects of, of industry, of, of professionals. And so um, we are agnostic on which disciplines we hire from. So uh, here you'll see examples of our of our consortium members, and and one of the unique things when when this consortium was started, it's a non-compete consortium, and what that means is that uh, existing members have veto powers over new members if they feel they're a direct competitor. Now the reason for that it's not that we don't take our proprietary nature of these part files very seriously because we do, um, it's the fact that all of our members are always invited to come down to our facilities test out new equipment uh, in a hands-on way, do part reviews, design reviews, et cetera. And we wanted to eliminate any possibility of somebody inadvertently seeing a competitor's part. We also want our consortium members to be willing to talk to each other freely, uh, compare wins, compare losses, kind of share knowledge. And, and that's really where we sit as kind of an informational conduit amongst our members in non-related industries. So it makes for a, a, a wide variety of use cases, uh, of, of demands um, as far as performance, aesthetics, et cetera, different applications. And, and the other unique thing is it allows us to kind of transfer information from non-related industries. So things we, information we glean from, from working on a project in one industry, uh, we can share with another industry without fear of our consortium members losing a competitive advantage. <laughs> 
So again, a little bit of the mission of the consortium to provide deliverable value to our industrial consortium members. Um, that's huge. We really take that seriously, especially the deliverable value aspect. Um, we, we provide parts and, and solutions, but I think with each of our projects, we also try to deliver a little bit of consultative type knowledge. So our, we have two main goals anytime a project comes in. One is to solve our consortium members' problems, and two is to educate them and kind of make them a little bit more of a sophisticated customer. The second mission is to train the additive manufacturing of professionals of tomorrow. And like I said earlier in the, in the talk, uh, we're very proud of the fact that we've had a, a big impact on, on kind of spreading the seeds of, of additive manufacturing experts around the industry. When you look at the amount of MSOE alum that have made an impact uh, on our industry, that, that's pretty compelling. Uh, sec then to provide additive manufacturing industry with the voice of the customer. It's rather unique that we have such a diverse uh, non-compete consortium. And uh, what we found is that that provides a lot of value to OEMs when they're trying to understand what does the industry need. So we get involved in a lot of beta programs, uh, testing out new equipment, new hardware, new materials, new software, and we can test it out on such a wide variety of different industries. It provides a tremendous amount of value uh, in terms of voice to the customer, um, applications testing, operational feedback back to the OEMs. Uh, and then finally, to provide MSOE faculty with the professional development opportunities and support, as well as our student population. Again, when we do projects here at MSOE, um, I think we take it one step further than a lot of uh, universities. Um, we always push our students and our faculty to really understand and articulate the value proposition of additive manufacturing. So really any project we do, whether it's for our consortium or internal for our MSOE community, our goal is to not only solve the problem, but also add a bit of an educational solution to it. So providing value to the consortium. You know, why would companies want to join our consortium? One, it's kind of a unique aspect and, and really it, it goes back to our initial challenge uh, in solution and that's providing shared access to a world-class additive manufacturing services and expertise. So it's a way for companies to kind of pay a, a, a portion of what they would have to to get access to this equipment. Um, and then that not only provides them access to the deliverables coming off that equipment, but access to test out that equipment, to come down to understand the operational considerations, to talk to unbiased um, uh, operators of the equipment, et cetera. Uh, secondly, helping our members develop additive manufacturing applications that add value to their operations. So when we when a new member joins, we really get to understand what their challenges are, what their operations are, uh, what their needs are, and then help kind of guide them through the path of where additive manufacturing can add value. There's a ton of demand out there and a ton of interest, and we're blessed to have that in the additive manufacturing space. But uh, at the end of the day, for it to add sustainable value, it comes down to finding those applications where it saves money for the company, saves time, et cetera. So then providing members with early access to newly released, released technologies. Uh, as David said, there is uh, a plethora of new materials coming on the market, new technologies, new solutions, um, new solutions for printing, for post-processing, for pre-processing softwares, et cetera. And it's kind of keeping our members aware of what's coming uh, in, in this market space and allowing them to test it out early. And then finally, professional development resources. We also put on five meetings a year where we bring uh, compelling new technologies in to talk to our members. Uh, and our members are invited to, to send uh, their employees down. Uh, they get uh, continuing education credits as well as hopefully uh, a great awareness of, of, of new technologies that can make a difference in their operations. So now I wanna talk a little bit about barriers to op to adoption. I, uh, being in the educational uh, community, I, I hear a lot about this kind of being a bridge between education and, and added manufacturing. Folks are always saying, what are the biggest barriers to adoption? And, and this is a little bit of a soapbox for me, but uh, I wanted to do something a little bit different maybe than all the other speakers. I know we've got a lot of speakers on here today. Um, and so I like to talk a little bit about hype versus value. 
So what I've got here is is two applications uh, from the same company. Both were made uh, for for Wilson. Um, the the one here, uh, the the airless basketball. Not sure how many of you folks saw this. Um, it was uh, probably an exciting engineering challenge to get a elastomeric material without any air to bounce and feel like a basketball. But um, when I look at it, and I'm always very value focused, like how does this application add value? And so <clears throat> I, I struggle to understand how an airless basketball adds value intrinsically um, and why you would want to use one. You know, growing up in, in the upper Midwest, I'll, I'll tell you what, basketballs always seem to be a mud puddle magnet uh, anytime you're playing on the courts. And gosh, uh, a, a lattice structured basketball like this, first time it goes in the mud, it's gonna be awful uh, difficult to wipe it off on your sweatshirt. So it doesn't perform better than a basketball. The biggest solution that I've heard it solves is the lack of air, but it increases the cost of shipping. Um, it's an expensive part to build because there's a lot of wasted volume inside. It's not, in my professional opinion, an effective use of additive manufacturing. Now, if we take a look on the other side, again, uh, another Wilson project, uh, their paddle ball rackets made by another company. And what I like about the paddle ball rackets is because it articulates a value proposition. There, there's an issue, and I, I've, I've, last time I played paddle ball was uh, 25 years ago back in high school but it is the fastest growing uh, sport in the world, I'm told. And uh, one of the key issues that folks complain about, neighbors complain about around paddleball courts is the noise. And the noise can have significant decibels and be very loud and disruptive, especially these, these uh, complexes now that are being developed with numerous courts, a uh, lot of complaints from the noise. And so what they were able to do using a complex lattice structure is renew, reduce the noise significantly while increasing the performance of the ball coming off the racket. And so, you know, when I look at this and I think what we need to do to really increase um, adoption of additive manufacturing is move away from kind of the, the hype projects that, that don't articulate the value, that just are there because it's cool. You know, this airless basketball was, uh, I believe, debuted during the dunk contest at the NBA All-Star Game, which is great, it's cool, but it doesn't help folks understand the right way to look at additive to add value to their operations. Now, the paddle ball racket, you know, you can articulate some engineering tools and, and some value proposition that make this a better product in the long run. And that, that's what I like about it. So I want to talk a little bit about adding value with additive. This is this is kind of the biggest things that, that, that we're asked oftentimes. And, and I, I hope this helps a lot of the listeners out there. Um, everybody is excited about additive, but the biggest challenge is, OK, now I'm excited. Where do I go with it? How do I look around my factory floor and find things that make sense? Um, and so <clears throat> a couple of the key characteristics, and again, some of this is a little bit uh, redundant. David already touched on this, you know, weight savings. Weight savings is great, right? Um, and sometimes folks, uh, you know, they, they, they talk about that, but weight savings only matters if it adds value to, to your design, okay? Think of aerospace, Think of, and I love the the uh, the jigs and fixtures one. A big uh, big movement in the manufacturing space is cobots. Uh, gosh, I was down at IMTS last year, and I, I don't think there was a booth without a cobot in it anywhere. Now, the the challenge with anything with robotics is you pay based on payload and performance, and so weight equals value. So I think when we look at places that are manufacturer can add a lot of value in the future, it's uh, robotic end effectors. Uh, labor and we touched on that a little bit as well <clears throat> you know not only uh the manual labor aspect of it but there is a skilled labor shortage you know uh, like david said that you know years ago you would have to go to your local machine shop or model shop and have folks uh produce a model for you those are far and few between unfortunately and they're very busy and so it's 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 a way to automate some skilled labor uh performance you know, we touched on that with the with the example of the rackets. If you can uh, do a better design that adds performance to whatever you're trying to accomplish through complexity, that adds value. You, know, you think of the GE fuel nozzle. Uh, that's a prime example of getting better flow, which equals better fuel economy. 
Uh, that's a way to add performance. Time to market, again, we touched on this. Time to market is huge, depending on what industries you're in. It affects everyone, um, but certain industries certainly more than others. Uh, cost, cost I put down low a little bit because, uh, you know, one of the things that uh, when, we're, when we get a new company in or a new group of engineers, and they bring to us maybe a plastic injection molded part, and they say, "Hey, we'd like to we'd like to explore using additive to produce this." And, it, and I look at it, and I can tell it's already being molded. And I say, "Look, do you, do you guys have tooling already for this?" And they say, "Yes, we do." <clears throat> What's wrong with the part you have now? What are you trying to accomplish? Well, we'd like a, we'd like to produce it cheaper. Uh, Ninety nine percent of the time, ninety nine point. 999% of the time, that's going to be a fool's errand because additive manufacturing is one of the most expensive manufacturing processes on the planet, largely. Um, and so if you're just looking at piece part savings, for especially for a product that's already tooled, you're going to most likely be disappointed. You've got to take more of a holistic uh, view on it. It doesn't mean it's a, it's a, it's a non-starter. But you have to have another problem you're trying to solve beyond just a 10% cost reduction in a ready tooled part. You've got to look, is there maintenance issues? Would you like to redesign it? Is there inventory issues? Those kinds of things. And that ties right into our next one, inventory management. Again, I won't touch on this a whole lot, David. I thought did a great job of articulating it. Uh, we'll skip right down to design risk or serial production. Uh, we've got companies that uh, that make products that are very low volume products, heavily tied to the uh, to the sensor and optics industry. Uh, those products change quite frequently, and it's uh, they're always on a design risk because they've got low value components that hold high value components that change frequently. And so when you have something like that, you've got a high risk of, of design change. The risk of investing in tooling becomes um, <clears throat> kind of cost prohibitive. Uh, uh, so the ability to maybe pay a little bit more for a part, but not have yourself tied to a more expensive component in the future makes a lot of sense. Or ser serial production, you see a lot of that in the medical industry. The uh, the aligners, David uh, mentioned, um, uh, medical jigs, fixtures, et cetera, all great examples. Keys to adoption, just a couple of keys to kind of put in your back pocket. Just because you can print anything doesn't mean you should print everything. I tell this to our students all the time. Um, additive manufacturing is a manufacturing process, right? And it is just like any other manufacturing process, you need to design for it. And because it's expensive, which leads to my second one, you have to articulate the value proposition of each part of your design. You know, we've got unlimited design freedom, but that doesn't mean it's a good excuse to be a lazy designer. I, I would go the other direction and say, additive manufacturing forces you to really uh, tighten up your designs to the point where you can articulate what each part of your design is doing. And, and that's one of the, the key components we try to drive home when working on student projects or, or helping our students understand how to use additive appropriately. And then learning the opportunities and limitations of each process. Each of these different uh, additive manufacturing processes that David went through, they each have their own pros and cons, limitations, et cetera. Um, and it, when you can understand each one of those, you can understand where it can add value and where it can uh, bring solutions to the table. And I would even say it's it's uh, it's important to understand it, the competitive processes, you know, uh, cast urethanes, blow molding, CNC, water jetting, forming, et cetera, because then you really understand what those processes do well and what they struggle with. And if they're struggling with it, that's a good opportunity to look at additive. And then finally, partner with a pragmatic expert. Um, you know, we've got some great resources here on this this uh, webinar for you guys. I think that uh, this is a rapidly changing industry, and um, you want somebody that you can trust. You want somebody that can guide you, keep you aware of of updates in the in the in the uh, industry, and help you understand where you can add value internally. So with that, I will move on to the next uh, presenter and uh, look forward to the discussion in the future. Awesome, thank you so much, Vince. Appreciate that, great focus on value. Um, next up, we have Steve Grundall from Midwest Prototyping um, right here in Wisconsin down in Madison. Steve, we look forward to your presentation.
Thanks, Jill. Thanks for putting this together. It's great to be here today. Um, sorry, I had a minor technical difficulty, but it looks like I got back on just in time. So uh, let me share the screen here. And All right. Can you see that? There we go. Perfect. Thank you okay. so much. It's Great. it's in there. Uh, so as Jill mentioned, I'm from Midwest Prototyping in uh, Blue Mounds, Wisconsin, just outside of Madison. Um, let's see if we can. There we go. Uh, so we say that our mission is to connect great ideas with innovative technologies. And the way we look at this, we look at our customers and the users of 3D printing as having the great ideas. Uh, it's our job to focus on the technology, to be experts in the technology, and really be able to guide you in getting whatever you're trying to accomplish. And, and uh, David and Vince have given some great examples of all the different areas that this technology can impact. So, um, so we really focus on, on that side of it, just, you know, providing the expertise with the technology and letting you come up with the great ideas. Um, these terms get thrown a lot, around a lot. We see rapid prototyping as, you know, helping people develop new products, iterate very quickly. And then we see additive manufacturing as really using that same technology of 3D printing to make parts that go out in the real world and are used in some fashion, in some fashion resold uh, or, you know, used to, uh, to accomplish a specific purpose uh, on a longer term. A uh, little bit about Midwest, I'll go through these slides really quickly because I know we've got a lot to get through yet today, but we were established in 2001. As uh, as Vince mentioned earlier, I went to MSOE in the very early days of them having uh, their first SLA machine. So I learned about the technology there uh, and then later started Midwest in 2001. Uh, a couple years ago, similar to David's story, we were acquired by a private equity firm uh, and we operate under the Prototech group now. So there's I think nine different locations across the country uh, doing everything from CNC manufacturing or CNC machining, sheet metal, and then we brought the additive manufacturing uh, part of the equation to that group. Uh, so as I mentioned, we're in Blue Mounds, Wisconsin. We've got, the, on the additive side, we've got facilities in Colorado, Pennsylvania, and then a couple other locations here locally that we've, we've grown out of our original space. Um, we run six different additive technologies and we'll go through those really quick. Um, I think we're at like 52 printers right now across the different locations and, uh, you know, always looking to add to that. Um, about 70 full-time staff on the additive side. Prototech as a whole, I think is about 350 people. Uh, we right now are printing about 32,000 parts a month out of our facility here in Blue Mountains. So, uh, a lot of variety, a uh, very diverse customer base, and that's what makes it fun. We get to see a lot of different things from uh, the people we deal with every day. Uh, so this is a little bit of insight on that. Um, you know, last couple of years, we've worked with about 800 different companies each year. And uh, they're everything from automotive and healthcare on down the list here. Uh, a lot of food processing applications coming these days, uh, a lot of lab instrumentation, uh, scientific devices, medical devices, uh, motorsports is a big area for us. And then just, you know, I put manufacturing there. Manufacturing obviously covers a lot of different bases, but David alluded earlier to, you know, jigs and fixtures and manufacturing floor, uh, and he showed that great video. So it's a lot of that kind of stuff that that is, you know, maybe not the sexiest side of 3D printing, but boy, it really makes a difference to the bottom line and helps people get things done. Uh, so here's just a few pictures of various projects over the years. Uh, David and Vince will certainly relate to this, but the problem with this industry is everything's confidential and you can't show anything until it's basically outdated. But, uh, but it is fun to, uh, to be able to show some things from time to time. Uh, our in-house technologies, and there's a lot of information here, so I'm going to go through these really quickly, but the point is that uh, for us, there's no one, one 
printer fits all, right? I mean, there are a lot of different technologies and materials and approaches out there. And and David covered some of that on, on his slides. Um, we find that as we grow our customer base and grow that diversity, we need different approaches all the time. And, and that's how the business has grown over the last 22 years, I guess. Um, so we'll jump into this. Uh, stereolithography uh, is what I learned about at MSOE all those years ago, and, and it's really the technology that started the industry. Um, we've got 24 machines across our different locations, and this is still a big focus for us. For our design firms and our customers that are iterating very quickly, this is still a great technology. Uh, carbon, this is a DLP-based process. Um, we have this both here and in our Pennsylvania facility. Uh, the advantage here is, is quick turn and some really uh, robust materials. Uh, the material science side of this technology is pretty interesting. And it's been everything from elastomers. Um, Adidas makes a shoe now that is printed with the carbon technology that's it's widely available and you may have seen uh, HP, uh, we'll hear more about this, and, and David already covered a little bit too. This is uh, just another great um, tool in our toolbox to help us, you know, fill the needs of customers that need particularly nylon parts uh, in our case. So we're using that at our various locations as well. Uh, Polyjet, uh, we don't do a ton of this, but it's uh, valuable when you need certain material properties and certain uh, combinations of materials in one printed part. Uh, laser sintering, this is a big part of our operation. And again, uh, nylon-based materials typically, we can do flame retardant materials, we can do uh, materials that can be treated to be uh, used in all sorts of different applications. Um, we can print fairly large parts here, up to 27 inches. Uh, so this is, a, this is a nice way for us to do, and a lot of the actual manufacturing we do, uh, additive manufacturing is done with this technology. FDM, uh, David used uh, one of my favorite sayings too, this is like a fancy hot glue gun. Um, and they uh, are very, very well-known machines, fairly easy to operate and a really wide range of materials. So uh, this is available uh, at many, many places throughout the country. And a lot of our customers have this type of equipment in their own facilities as well. Uh, this is a new one. Um, so we were the first ones to bring this to the, the US. We had the first machine actually in the world. It's still in, in beta test, but this is a combination of DLP that you saw earlier with the carbon machine and traditional SLA. And I won't go too deep into this, but really it gives us very high throughput with a premium surface finish. And it's something we're testing and Vince and his team are also testing it at MSOE. So uh, we're, we're pretty excited about this one and um, should give us a, a way to really explore the, a lot of the new materials that are out on the market. Uh, we do a lot of urethane casting, which is sort of a, uh, a rudimentary injection molding process, but we print the patterns with uh, 3D printing technology, and then we can make multiple parts in uh, typically thermoset materials uh, that really give people uh, a way to do short run production and, and some early testing uh, without committing to injection mold tooling and some of the uh, expense and time that goes along with that. Uh, and I mentioned we do CNC machining and sheet metal uh, just a little bit here, but at the Prototech locations, that's a, a much larger offering now as part of our network. Um, a lot of parts get finished uh, to look like the real thing, be used for trade shows or photo shoots or you know marketing presentations or whatever it may be. And uh, there's a lot of value in this being able to uh, get a read from a customer before you've committed to making, uh, as David alluded to, inventory problems, you know, having thousands of something sitting on the shelf and, and then finding out if people want to buy it. Um, you can do it on the early side this way. Uh, but this is maybe really the most important slide when, you know, we think about all the manufacturing in, in the NWTC network and all the different applications. Um, you know, what matters to you? How do you want to use 3D printing? What problems do you need solved? So I just, you know, in five minutes or less, put together this list of 
of things we've done. You know, we've made parts that are food safe, that are Teflon coated, dishwasher safe. Uh, you can seal surfaces and make them impermeable to liquids and gases. Uh, they can be biocompatible, they can be implantable, um, parts can be transparent and clear. Uh, a big part of our business is, you know, on the manufacturing side, making parts that have internal vacuum passages. Uh, so if when you think of web-based materials being processed, you know, there's a lot of paper and associated processing that goes on in Wisconsin. Um, being able to move uh, pieces of material by applying or uh, releasing vacuum is, uh, is a big, uh, big advantage to making lightweight and really novel parts. Um, the same thing applies in the pneumatic and hydraulic space too. Um, to make parts that are lightweight, hollow them, you can use lattice structures. Uh, printed parts can be metal plated. Uh, so, uh, you know, if you need something nickel plated or copper plated, that can be done. Um, they can be, we make parts that are flight certified, uh, go right on airplanes and fly every day. So uh, that's, uh, you know, the aerospace industry has really adopted 3D printing as they've uh, as they've grown and you know discovered the advantages David mentioned earlier you know lighter and uh, lighter and stronger uh, FST is flame smoke and toxicity so that again follows on to the aerospace and automotive space um, obviously those requirements exist when you're going to put passengers in something but uh, there are now materials that can be printed that are FST rated um and then there's just so many other things that you know i think between the the group on this call we could probably make this list pages and pages long but as we we think about all the the users and the manufacturers in wisconsin that is uh that's what we really want to understand is is what you know what problems do you need solved and how can we continue to grow uh 3d printing and and this is you know this is kind of the space that vince lives in with the consortium and all his different members coming and saying you know this is this is what we're trying to solve and these are just some of the examples that we've seen so far um i alluded to the aerospace thing i just threw this slide in here so so people understand i mean we're iso certified we're as 9100 certified which is is aerospace um some places are ISO 13485 medical certified. We're not because that's not a huge part of our business yet. But um, but the accreditation bodies are recognizing that 3D printing is real. You can make parts that go into airplanes, that go into operating rooms, that go into all sorts of manufacturing environments. And this is really important that uh, that we all continue to grow the industry, you know, in a way that will be accepted and. Uh, gives gives customers ultimately a little more comfort that uh, you know this has been vetted in a in a very professional way uh, and that's all I have I just want to go through those real quick so we can get to the questions um, you can find us at midwestproto.com and uh, you know if there's any questions we can answer please reach out that was perfect steve thank you so much um you know love love learning about some of the different new things that are coming there um and our final presenter we have asia hartman joining us from the west coast so thank you for getting up early this morning asia um but look forward to your presentation on what's on the horizon um and what do we see in terms of digital transformation coming from hp thank you jill can you hear me and see the slides all right Yep, yep, it looks perfect. Great job. Perfect. Well, thanks for the invitation. I'm here kind of representing HP's perspective on this digital transformation and in industry 4.0. A little background, I work at hmm, HP Labs, and this is a, a research uh, group within HP. It's not its own business unit and it uh, works on different things that can be related to a current business unit or brand new technology. So it's considered one of the um, the birthplace of innovation in Silicon Valley. HP and Varian are considered the forefathers of kind of the whole Silicon Valley community and they're located in Stanford Research Park. Uh, Palo Alto has the headquarters for HP Labs. 
and it was founded in 1966, and you may have heard of the pocket calculator. That was one of HP Lab's first products, and um, they were trying to find out how do you fit a calculator in your pocket. There'd never been one that small before, and there wasn't a business unit for calculators, so uh, the founders of HP decided we're going to build a lab that isn't tied specifically to business units so that they could work on projects like these. So we are located, again, in Palo Alto headquarters, which is where HP was founded, and there's another location in Bristol in the UK. So just a quick overview. I'm going to do half the time in terms of what are the key developments in 3D printing, what are the new products HP has launched in 3D in the past 12 months, and then go into what's the future look like, what is HP Labs working on, and things that might be seen in products in the future. So I know uh, we had Vince and Dave also talk a little bit in terms of the metal jet and the multi-jet fusion. HP has two different uh, main materials in terms of polymers 3D printing and then metals 3D printing. So for metal jet, it uses this binder technology and um, first you lay out the powder, then you use the binder in order to kind of glue the powder particles together and this forms a green part. You dry and cure this green part and then put it in a furnace, which then will burn out all of that uh, glue type material, which is our binder, and uh, melt the part to get a solid 3D printed part. And with our multi-jet fusion, we similar powder bed fusion, we're laying out powder, and then we have two different agents, a fusing agent, which absorbs the light energy transforms it to heat and actually melts the powder particles together and a detailing agent which prevents the coalescence and makes very sharp part surfaces so that the powder next to a really hot part is cool enough to not fuse and you do this layer by layer till you get your part and you had seen in some previous uh, presentation where you're actually you have a lot of powder and you have to do some archeological digging to get your part out and then do the post-processing of sandblasting cleaning and whatever post-processing surface finishes that you um, need for your specific application. So this is a new product that just launched. This is the Jet Fusion 5420W and this produces white parts. So our first uh, printers that were printing polymers produced black parts. Um, these ones are, can be used for medical applications and are also easier to post-process because they're white, you're able to dye them. Uh, in the top, you can see pictures of some of the parts printed. So one part is the natural white color of the parts printed on this printer, and then one is dyed blue so that you can see the, the different um, finishes that you can have with these parts. And this is a healthcare application as well. It's a helmet that's used on babies. Um, if they have malformed skulls, this will help gently shape them to be um, more natural rounded skull shape. So you can see the whole production line here. Um, I know we've gone through the processing station, which helps clean, reclaim the powder. So we're recycling that powder in next builds, and this helps it be more ecological and more cost efficient. The build unit and the natural cooling unit and the printer. And here's a new system, which is the automated unpacking system station. And so you can put the trolley into this unpacking station and it'll um, reclaim the powder on its own without um, human you know, interaction and labor. Here's the new HP Metal Jet S100. And you've seen a video earlier on this. These are the different um, parts of the solution. And uh, here you can see we have this management powder management station, which sieves and loads the powder into the build unit. And that's separate from the powder removal station, which is where you put your build trolley in to recover that powder and help with um, preparing the build unit for the next print. 
and then this is the curing station after the print where you're kind of getting that um, green part ready to then be put into a furnace where you have the final step of the process and getting your metal part. And here's an example of a stainless steel part printed using HP's metal jet technology. So on to the future work that we're working on at HP Labs. So at the beginning showing MJF, you could see we put down a fusing agent and a detailing agent. This is based off of HP's 2D print technology. So we're able to put down uh, many different materials that we can then change properties on a voxel level because we're able to basically do a 2D print and stack them layer by layer like pancakes in the previous presentation um, and make different composites on the fly. So this is the electronic voxel and you see you're putting electronic agent and your fusing agent to create your part and you'll have two different materials. You'll have just your fused normal. This an example is we're using nylon 12. And you also have your composite material, which you can see the nylon 12 powder particles that are centered with, that are coated with this silver um, conductive agent that is also centered, forming a network throughout the uh, voxel to voxel connectivity so that you can print um, continuous uh, conductive traces. And so this is kind of the, the technology, how that works. But in terms of why does this matter and what's an application for this, we're trying to do embedded intelligence and create these smart parts. And here's an example of a strain gauge. So this is a part, it has a printed conductive internal wiring. And as you deflect the part, you're going to get a change in resistance due to the stretching of these traces. So we put uh, some more electronics on board to make it Bluetooth compatible and be able to um, basically share the information of what the strain the part is experiencing. And we had an app to show that. So as you added weights to this um, setup, it would cause more strain on the part and then you'd be able to measure that. And why, what's an example where this would matter? So if you have parts that are able to sense how many cycles of loading they've gone through, because a lot of materials have um, a certain amount of cycles before failure based on a certain design, um, this really helps you to monitor that so you'd know, hey, we're 50% through the life cycle or I'm noticing um, more strain than usual. Maybe there's something else in this assembly that's failing, that's causing more strain on this part than uh, should be occurring. So these are some examples of what can be enabled with this conductive voxel. And here you can just see some an x-ray of the internal wiring. So you can see really the fidelity of those traces um, from inside the part. So this is an example of what's being worked on in polymers. We have a lot of other types of voxels being worked on with different types of um, properties, whether they're, this example is conductive, but there's many other examples of how to change material properties and create these composites on the fly. So here's an example of metals. So what are we doing in metals at HP Labs? These are some examples of 3D printed parts that um, help with these, the bottom one and the one on the right on my screen show ways of cooling parts very efficiently. We're able to have um, certain flow and control flow characteristics. We're able to increase the surface area with these 3D um, geometries so that we can really effectively and efficiently draw heat out of a system. And here's some, some electronic parts. So why is copper 3D printing interesting? it's very efficient in terms of thermal and electrical conductivity. So it really can help uh, increase the value in those areas. And due to the design freedom, we're able to create new, new uh, 
new types of designs that are able to much more effectively um, create solutions in these space. So for other technologies, there's other um, powder bed fusion technologies that use lasers and things to melt uh, the metal particles. But due to the optical reflectivity, they usually end up damaging the laser or the um, mirrors used in the laser. Because when you're shining this really intense energy, if you have this optical reflectivity, you're basically bouncing it right back at your emitter. So that's very challenging. And then there's other binder jet technologies, but these ones, the binder that they're using um, oxidizes during the process of uh, sintering and, and your part in the furnace. So these other binders end up um, contaminating your part. And this really takes a hit in terms of thermal and electrical properties because they're very sensitive to oxidation. Um, and so one of the uh, other issues is difficulty to center high density and maintain geometric integrity with other binders, especially if they're debinding at lower temperatures. You don't have that kind of glue holding these metal particles together while they're sintering and copper uh, melts at a very high temperature. So that can be very challenging, but we have a special binder that we're working on at HP Labs that's able to both not oxidize the part during this process at nearly the same levels, and two, work at these high temperatures to help hold the part integrity um, during this process. So with that, I just wanted to say thank you. Tried to blast mm -hmm. through there and had a lot of help from colleagues here on the line who are um, <laughs> giving uh, summaries beforehand. So thank you so much, Jill, and back to you. Awesome. Well, thank you so much to all of you, Asia. Thank you. Um, but to all four of you, we really appreciate it. We've gotten some fantastic questions. We don't have a lot of time, but I would like to get a couple of questions out there to you. We've had a couple of different questions about sustainability and additive manufacturing 3D printing. So questions about do parts that are 3D printed tend to last as long as some of the other traditional manufacturing processes? And then in terms of recycling parts, um, are these parts recyclable? I don't know, Vince, would you maybe wanna start a little bit with that? Uh, yeah, sure. Um, so that, the, the first part of that question is difficult, right? Um, do they last as long? And that's really a case by case. I mean, anytime you're trying to mimic uh, a different material out of a different process, you're going to have different mechanical properties, different life expectancy. Um, if done appropriately, it should last just as long. Um, I think if, if done not appropriately, it's going to be a challenge. Uh, on the recyclability side, it depends on if it's a thermal set like the the two-part epoxies or the 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 um, UV curables. Those are very difficult to recycle in any functional way. Uh, thermal plastics, are, I guess, are just as recyclable as any other thermal plastic. So there is potential for it. Again, all recycling is a challenge throughout the world when you're talking with small volumes and the cost benefit of that. Awesome. I'll let anybody else weigh in? Yeah, Asia, did you have some thoughts on that as well? Yeah, I can speak from an HP perspective, especially on the polymer side. So we're using thermoplastics. They're able to be recycled. And I know maybe it was David who was mentioning Smile Direct or Steve, um, David, yeah. So Smile Direct is one of the large um, partners with HP and they print these molds and that was a big portion is how do we do this sustainably? So HP actually has a recycling program and you can send your printed parts once you're done using them to HP and we actually uh, end up remelting them, pelletizing them and selling them to other companies for injection molding. So that's a term of recycling the actual parts and then in terms of the powder that gets recycled in our machines to then be used until they're created into parts. So it's creating kind of this circular economy which you know, is best for sustainability. And in terms of the um, warehouses and supply chain, there's a another perspective in that way that 
you're not having to take up a lot of space, do a lot of, you know, heating and cooling of a giant warehouse to keep this excess part inventory. If you're able to have a 3D printer and a library of all of your part files and CAD files, that can really help alleviate that uh, kind of giant resource that normally needs to be used in the supply chain industry. Awesome. That, that's fantastic. And, and ways to think about sustainability that I hadn't necessarily in terms of how do you use, you know, from a warehousing standpoint and supply chain. Um, so that's fantastic. We also had a couple of questions about the medical applications. Um, and I know, Asia, you showed that helmet that's used with children. And David, you talked about Invisalign. Um, I don't know, Steve, as you, you mentioned medical as some of the opportunities you've had in terms of prototyping. Are there any cool, new, different things you've seen in terms of medical um, as well that you might be able to share? Yeah, I can share what I know. Um, we do a lot with medical devices, you know, so instruments and, and you know, it could be the cart they roll into your room or the IV pump or that sort of thing where, you know, those things are constantly getting and redesigned and redeveloped. So, so that's, you know, you can almost consider that as a consumer product. It just happens to be medical in nature. And, and uh, so we've done a lot with that. You know, the more fascinating side of medical is the, the human impact that David touched on a little bit. And, uh, and you know, Invisalign and Smile Direct fall into that same category, right? I mean, it's it's uh, sort of a mass customization application to you know patient-specific human uh, need. Um, to me, it all depends on the materials because the technology is extremely capable right now. But as you can imagine, getting through the FDA and the various regulatory bodies when you're talking about using something on a patient's skin or implanting in a human or using in the operating room, there's various levels of, of certification. And I'm not an expert to speak on that. It gets, it gets very complex very quickly. But uh, if we can make materials that will pass these sort of regulatory hurdles, um, honestly, the, the opportunities are limitless. And the other side of the, the coin there is, you know, there's been uh, a lot of hypothesizing and some some actual work done printing with human cells and printing with human tissue. And again, that is not something that uh, that we uh, spend our time on on a daily basis, but I read about it a lot because it's fascinating. And um, I'll say that there's more that goes on in other countries where maybe the regulatory burden isn't quite as high. <laughs> and, and I don't know if that's good or bad. It's just the truth. Um, but uh, there's been some real advances in in places like New Zealand where they'll just, you know, they're willing to take a little more of a chance on some of this stuff. And, you know, they had some very early success with uh, cranial implants and, you know, uh, assisting people that have been injured, very severely injured in accidents or, you know, through disease or whatever. And, and that's the sort of the really hopeful, you know, good human story side of, of this technology is is seeing what it can do. We just don't know how close that reality really is. Yeah, very interesting in terms of, like you said, um, you know, I think that's truly the, the leading or bleeding edge of where the technology is going. Um, but, you know, it, there are a lot of those regulatory kind of hurdles that would be interesting. Um, Similarly, you know, I think you caught some folks' attention there, David, when you mentioned food, too, and printing food. Um, I don't know if you have any other perspective on that, but the question was, you know, what are the requirements to print food? Um, and is that going to be Star Trek where you can, you know, they, I can't remember the replicator for, you know, the food. Um, are, are we getting closer to that? <laughs> it's it's a nice thought. Um, I'm, you know, kind of similar. <clears throat> to steve we we focus on mechanical parts here um but i read a lot about this stuff as well um the technology is only getting better the technology is it the we're, we're able to build with smaller building blocks at a faster rate so you know in theory if you're building things at the nano level it's the, yeah. the possibilities are virtually endless with what you can piece together 
I'd like to weigh in a little bit on the food only because I've been, you know, I, anybody that knows me knows I'm a pretty skeptical person uh, in general and <laughs> in big focus on, uh, on adding intrinsic value to a situation. And, um, you know, I was talking with, uh, with a relative of mine who's a thought leader in the nursing home extended care industry and talk about printing food because, you know, uh, what I've seen, what it started at is uh, sugar labs, printing sugar and, and chocolates, things like that, that are a little bit of a marketing kind of novelty. But, but she brought up a kind of an interesting application, and, and that's folks that uh, have a hard time chewing or as they, you know, age and, and have other medical situations. And she said that, you know, a big part in the aging community is getting folks to eat. It, it can be a challenge. Um, and that there's studies that show that if the food looks appetizing, um, they have a higher likelihood and, and higher percentage of eating. So sometimes you have to reformulate the nutritional value and make it in a, in a, texture that'll that's it's chewable for them or swallowable for them in that there's a potential application for 3d printing those kind of mixtures in an appetizing look that people will want to eat so there's a there's a value added potential opportunity for 3d printing food beyond just um it looks cool um and you can make like really cool designs or whatever yeah, awesome perspective. I hadn't thought of that, but you know, clearly, you know, that that sounds very, you know, applicable. Um, interesting. One other question that we got that I think um, a lot of companies here in northeastern Wisconsin, we do a lot of CNC machining and and making of parts. And the question was, what are the biggest limitations currently for metal 3D printing to be more affordable? Um, and so interested if anyone has any perspective on that. I can weigh in on that a little bit. Uh, I think you know when you look at the base price and what this what the what the floor is on price. A lot of it comes down to the material supply chain, and so I think when you start looking at uh, metal processes that have the potential to lower the cost, uh, there's a couple big big components to cost, and one is the material, right? And so if you're using a finely powdered uh, tight range distribution of powdered metals that, that doesn't uh, align to a wider supply chain. We just don't use enough of it as an industry to get that price per pound cheap enough. So I think, again, when you're looking at which processes have the potential, look at processes that are using an existing supply chain of materials. Uh, again, binder jetting, I think, is piggybacking off the material or the metal injection molding industry. So you're kind of partnering with an existing supply chain. So it has the potential to get that material cost lower or some of these, uh, these wire filament, um, like wire welders, essentially a robotic wire welder uh, has the ability to uh, get that those prices down a little bit lower. But it all comes down to kind of chicken and the egg as far as this industry needs to get a critical mass to get that price cheaper. You know, we see that kind of across the board. We, we, we yell and scream for cheaper prices, but, you know, on the UV curable side, you know, a big order is a pallet load of material versus, you know, maybe like a flooring company that's using a couple rail cars a week. Uh, and so we're just so small that it costs a lot of money to make small amounts of material for our industry. Yeah, and on the back end, um, the throughput, the 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 technology is not not at a point where you're making a lot of parts in one build. Uh, a lot of the DMLS laser systems are they're bound to basically the the 2D bed to make a part. Where some of the stuff that HP is is coming through with is being able to build in 3D with with their uh, cube print envelope so hopefully you know those kinds of advancements in the technology will allow us to to have much higher throughput for the material that we're using and then of course the post-processing you're having to especially with powdered metal you're having to take extra precautions because if you have humans back there, they, they you know they can't breathe this stuff. It's flammable. You have to have special equipment, special vacuums to to collect all the unused powder. So there's you know still a lot of work to be done on that end of of the spectrum as well. Great, thanks. And then kind of the final question is from um, one of our participants, 
asking what was the most fulfilling experience that you've had providing a 3D printed product to someone? Um, and I don't know, Steve, would, would you be willing to maybe share what the most, uh, what the most fulfilling project that you've gotten to work on might be, might have been? Yeah, and there's, I mean, there's a lot, obviously, but there's there's definitely one that stands out. And I replied to the uh, question, uh, I think it's privately, I don't know. Um, we had an opportunity a few years ago to work with a children's hospital and print uh, a pelvis and a spine model uh, for a young girl that had a really severe case of scoliosis. So you can imagine the spine was was very deformed or, or twisted. Um, this was going to be used in a in a teaching hospital so the surgeons wanted this ahead of time because they can't have all of the students in the operating room at the same time sort of getting the same experience so they were able to use this in in more of a classroom or clinical setting uh explain the problem obviously they had all the images and everything else to go along with it and then uh you know plan the plan the approach for the surgery and really educate the the students on this and uh, or the you know the residents um and they just they got back to us afterwards and said you know the model was great it allowed us to do all these things and by planning the surgery ahead of time the the young girl had less time on the operating table so less trauma and exposure for her and uh they said a more successful outcome and you know this is something that there there are now companies that specialize in doing surgical models uh it's it's something we sort of you know fall into from time to time because it's not a specialty of ours so so that one was particularly meaningful and and fun for me um, you know, we've made a lot of really cool mechanical parts and really creative you know, solutions over the years that as a as a mechanical engineer, you know, I'm always interested in. But when you can when you can see the human impact side of it like that, it it's just it's something that really stands out. That's awesome. Um, any other examples from the other folks? I don't want to leave other folks out. Um, that's a tough one to top. So Steve, good job. <laughs> <laughs> Um, excellent. Well, I really appreciate everyone's time. I think we've gone just a, a hair over our, our original um, goal in terms of timing, but it was definitely worth it. Thank you so much. Thank you, David. Thank you, Vince, Steve, and Asia. Fantastic content today. Um, this has been wonderful. We want to thank the National Science Foundation. Um, they provided a grant that allowed us to put together this seminar series um, to hopefully support these companies in Northeastern Wisconsin, as well as um, other folks. Um, and I also want to specifically thank our team here at NWTC, Northeast Wisconsin Technical College. Katie, who's behind the scenes here, making all our IT stuff work. Fantastic job. And Betsy, Kristen, Holly, Jason, Sue, Caitlin, and Erica, um, the last you know year that we've been putting this together, um, really appreciate the support from all parts of our college to make this seminar series a success. Um, this The recording of this will be um, on our website at nwtc.edu uh, slash innovation. So please, if, you're, if you found this helpful, um, feel free to point your colleagues to that um, videotape. And we're gonna be sending out a survey to folks who've been on this um, seminar today to get more of your feedback um, to see how we might be able to do more of these type of things in the future. So thank you everyone for your time. Thank you so much to our panelists. Um, and we look forward to hearing your feedback from our surveys. Have a great afternoon, everyone. Thank you so much. Thanks, Jill. Thanks. Bye-bye. Thanks, everyone.